This is Daryl presenting Apple's Develop and Swift Data Collections Curriculum, Unit 1, Lesson 1, Protocols. In Swift, a protocol is a blueprint listing methods, properties, and other requirements that your data structure must satisfy in order to conform to the protocol. The Swift Standard Library defines many protocols and we are going to learn about four of them in particular in this slide deck. Custom string convertible, equatable, comparable, and codable. When you adopt a protocol, you're, you must implement all the required methods and have all the required properties and any required initializers in order to comply. We've been using protocols all through this course. We've been printing strings, we've been printing numbers, and we've been printing booleans. The reason that works is because the print method actually will print anything that conforms to the custom string convertible protocol. Strings conform, integers conform, booleans conform, and if you make your own data structure conform to custom string convertible, then you can use the print method on your data structures too. Here we have one of our own custom classes, shoe. It has three properties, it has its initializer, we create an instance of shoe, and we try to print it out. And the only thing that prints out is the type of shoe. We don't actually get any useful information out of it. And that's because we do not conform to custom string convertible. So the print statement doesn't know what to print out. So all it can do is print out the type of our object. The first step in conforming to custom string convertible is we include that at the, the top of our class. So we have our class, and then we have our class name, and then we have a colon. And then if the class inherited from another class, then that other class would come first. In this case, shoe does not inherit from another class. And then after the other, cl the other class we inherit from, if it existed, we'd have a comment, I mean, I'm sorry, a comma, and then we would have the protocol that we are conforming to. We could have a list of protocols that we conform to, each of them separated by a comma. In this case, we only want to conform to custom string convertible. As soon as we do this, the compiler will show that we have an error because we say we conform to custom string convertible. However, we do not conform to custom string convertible. In, in this case, custom string convertible, we need a uh, computed property which we need to have a computed property in order to conform with the protocol. However, the compiler where we have the X mark where the compiler will show us the error, we can click on that and we'll ask if it if the compiler will ask if we want to add the method stubs and the property stubs to conform with the protocol. And it's very convenient to click yes and then those stubs will exist and then you just need to fill them out. In the case of custom string convertible, the only thing that is required is that we have a computed property called description, which is of type string. And then we just fill it in and print out whatever we want to print out. In this case, we're returning a string where we say that we are a shoe and our color and our size and our has laces. And now we can instantiate a shoe and print out shoe. And when we print out, sh when we print shoe, the print f method will call our computed property and get this string and print it out. And you can see that it did that. Let's look at our next protocol, Equatable. Here we have a struct for a company which has an array of employees. And we want to see if any of the employees are equal to each other in terms of having the same name, first name and same last name, uh, which would probably mean that it is a duplicate entry. So we want to test if an employee already exists in our array. Here's our struct for employee. We have first name, we have last name, we have job title, we have phone number. We need to test them for equality with each other, but by default, we cannot. Here's an example of our use case. We have a current employee, and then we create a new selected employee, and we want to see if the selected employee is the current employee, testing them for equality. But 
we by default we can't do that with our custom type the first thing we do is we make our employee struct con we we say that it conforms with the equatable protocol as soon as we do that the compiler shows an error we click on the x we click fix and then the method stubs that we need to comply with equatable are created for us and then we just need to fill in the logic in this case we have a static method which is equal equal and it has two parameters which are named LHS for left hand side and RHS for right hand side each of those parameters is an employee and we need to create a method which returns a boolean true if they are equal and false if they are not we need the we need to figure out our own logic to determine what it means to be equal is it sufficient for the first name and last name to both be equal or do we need to have also the job title and the phone number be equal in order for our entire struct to be considered equal for this implementation, we've decided that the first names being equal and the last names being equal means that our two structs would be equal. So we test that the first names are equal, and then we use the logical and, and we test that the last names are equal. And if both the first names and, and logical and and the last names are equal, then we return true, else we return false. The reality is that for a large company, it is certainly possible, in fact, probable, that two different human beings will have the same name. In this case, we have two James Kittles, we have two different jobs, and two different phone numbers, and unfortunately, our algorithm that we implemented on the prior slide would, cons would consider them equal, which means that one might end up with the other's paycheck. That's bad, so we need a better implementation. Here's an implementation where we tested that all four properties are identical before we consider that the two employees are equal. Let's say we had an array of employees. How would we sort them? Well, as humans, we know that we tend to sort by either first name and then last name or last name and then first name. In Swift, Swift the Swift sort methods by default use the comparable pro protocol. So we would need to have our employee struct comply, conform to the comparable protocol, and then we could use the Swift built-in sorting methods. Here's our employee struct. It already conforms with equatable. We want to add comparable. This shows the syntax for how one struct can conform to two protocols. We simply put the protocols in a list, and then we put the commas. If if the data structure was also a class and we wanted it to inherit from a superclass, then that superclass would have to be first in the list. The comparable protocol has two requirements. The first requirement is that we have an equal equal function. So comparable in effect requires that we already conform to equatable, or at least we have the, the equal equal function that equatable also requires. In addition, comparable requires a less than function. So we have a we have a left hand for the less than function we'd pass in two employees the parameter names would be LHS for left hand side and RHS for right hand side it would requ return a bool and the bool would be true if the left hand side was less less than the right hand side in this case we've chosen to make that mean that. The left hand side is less than the right hand side if and only if the last name of the left hand side is less than the last name of the right hand side. Now, last name is a string and string already conforms to the comparable property. So we can use that. Here we have an array of employees and then we use the sorted method to create a new array of sorted employees and in this case we're saying what function we sort by and that is the left uh, the less than function which we implemented when we conformed to comparable and then we print out our sorted employees here's another example where we reverse the sort order by 
sorting by the greater than function. But we didn't implement a greater than function. One of the advantages of conforming to comparable is that since we imp we implement the less than function and we implemented the equal equal function, the greater than function is implemented on our behalf by default. The codable protocol creates key value pairs from your object's property names and values and that can then be used by an encoder or decoder object. Most Swift types that you use from the standard library already conform to codable. So in this case, string already conforms to codable. So all of our properties conform to codable, but by default, our employee did not conform to codable. But if all of your, proper, if all of your properties in your structure class already conform to codable, then by, simply by adding codable conformance, the Swift compiler will generate codable conformance on your behalf, so you don't even need to implement any custom code. The JSON data format, or JavaScript object notation data format, is essentially a list of key value pairs that represent information. It is commonly used when working with web services. A JSON encoder can convert an object conforming to codable to JSON, which then can be easily encoded as data or displayed as a string that shows the key value pairs. The encode method on JSON encoder is a throwing function, a special type of Swift function that can return specific types of errors. In this case, we use the try keyword with the question mark to attempt to encode, and it results in an optional for encoded data. And then we're using the if let syntax to conditionally unwrap the optional and get our data. And then we're encoding the data as a string using UTF-8 format, so eight bits per character. And then we print out our JSON string. So in this case, our employee, the first name was Ben, and down here we have a key value pair where the key is first name and then Ben. And last name was Stott, so last name, Stott, job title, front desk. And so you can see that we've encoded our data in JavaScript object notation with a set of key value pairs. We will learn more about the try syntax in another lesson. We can create our own protocols. Here, we're defining a new protocol called Fully Named. We use the protocol keyword. We have the name of our protocol. A protocol is a type, so we use upper camel case. And then we have braces. And then we have the requirements of the protocol. In, our, in this case, our first requirement is that we have a property called full name. And we're able to, and, it, and it's a string, and we're able to read it. So it could be implemented as a full property, or it could be a read-only computed property. It doesn't matter. Either of those would conform with that requirement. The second requirement of our protocol is that it have a method called say full name, which has no parameters and does not return anything. Here we have a struct person, and we want person to conform with the fully named protocol. However, at this time, it does not conform with the protocol. We do not have the full name read-only property, and we do not have a save full name method. Here is the implementation of our protocol. The first, we have full name, which is a read-only computed property, which returns a string. And in our case, it's returning the first name followed by the last name. And then the second requirement is that we have a save full name method that does not take any parameters and does not return anything. And here is our method. All it does is print out the name. Note that the protocol does not specify what the implementation is. We could do nothing here and it would still conform with the protocol. The requirement is that we have the method and that the parameters match and the return values match. In UI kit, they commonly use a architecture called delegation to deal with events. Here is a protocol button delegate where the requirement is that you have a function which is named user tapped button and the it has one parameter and the parameter points to a button 
and the external name of the parameter is blank and the internal name of the parameter is button. And then here we have a class game controller which conforms to button delegate and it has a function user tapped button and it has the correct parameters and the implementation is that it prints out that the user tapped the button and when it prints when it prints that out it actually prints the title of the button by accessing the button parameter that was passed into the method here's a button class that's going to use our button delegate protocol to send a message that the button was pressed and so the button has a property which is named delegate and it is of type optional button delegate. So it could be nil or it could actually point to a, a delegate. And if the button is tapped, then the button will attempt to send a message to the delegate using the user tapped button method. The button knows that the delegate has the user tapped button method because that was the requirement of the button delegate protocol. When it sends the message, it will use optional chaining. So if the delegate is nil, it will not result in a crash and nothing will occur. And when it sends the message, it includes one parameter, which is itself. And that way, when the the delegate receives the user tapped button method, it will also receive, know which button was pressed. Here's an example of using the button. We create our start button. We also create a game controller. And then we set the button's delegate to be the game controller. And then if we, tap, if we use the tapped method on the button, then the button will send the message to its delegate, which is the game controller. So for that same example, we tapped the button and then the button attempted to send a message, user tapped button to its delegate, which is the game controller. And the user tapped button method came in and it prints out the user tapped the button. And the parameter that the button sent in this method call was itself. So that way the controller knows which button was pressed and can look up the button's title, which is a string and include that in the printout. This delegation is a common method in UIKit where you have an object that needs to send messages to other objects and you set them up with delegates. Here's another example with two buttons. Here we have a start music button and a stop music button. Each button has a title. Each button's delegate is the music controller. So if we press either button, it will send the message to the music controller. But when it sends the message to the music controller, the self that it sends will be either the start button or the stop button, and they have different titles. Here's the code for the music controller. If either of the buttons is pressed, then it will receive a user tapped button message where the specific button is included as a parameter. Then it tests if the calling button was the play button. And if it was, then it will, the music controller will start playing the song. Else, if the button title is the stop button, then the music controller will pause the song. If you are following the Apple curriculum, you can open up the protocols playground and complete that in the lab. The slide deck was created by Apple and is licensed by Apple under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 4.0 International License.